you don't mind. Welcome, everyone. My name is Daniel Barkowitz, and I'm the Assistant Vice President for, Na for Financial Assistance and Student Employment at the University of Miami. It is my pleasure to, warrant, uh, to welcome you here tonight to our presentation. I'm thrilled to see so many of you, um, and we're happy you decided to join us for a couple hours this evening on a very important topic. Uh, I'm in, working in partnership with Bridge to Life and the Broward Education Foundation, and want to extend a warm welcome to every one of you. Uh, as we tonight dive into a national advisor training on FAFSA and FAFSA awareness. Um, so a couple of ground rules before we get started. I guess I should probably say a little bit more about myself in the introduction. So I am a financial aid professional who's worked in the, in the business for over 35 years. I've worked in very large institutions and very small institutions. Uh, I was director of financial aid at MIT and Columbia University. Um, I was uh, AVP Assistant Vice President of Financial Aid at Valencia College in Orlando, uh, and I've worked at a combination of, as I said, public and private, um, highly selective and open access institutions. Tonight, my role is not to promote any particular college, but really to help you, help us, help students uh, succeed in college attainment. That really is the goal tonight, and to make their dreams of higher education a reality. So again, I want to I want to thank all of you for spending some time with us this evening. A couple of uh, pieces to be aware of as we go through tonight. Yes, this uh, webinar tonight is being recorded, so you will be sent a copy of the recording um, as well. There's a link to the slides, not this first set, but the second set I'm going to share with you, which is actually the FAFSA walkthrough. You'll have a link to the slides in case you want to look at that later. Um, again, you'll have a copy of the recording that will all be sent an email to you after tonight is over. So please feel free to take notes if you'd like to, but keep in mind, you will get a copy of the recording. Both the chat box and the Q&A Q are open. Uh, in the Q&A is where we will take any questions you have. Please do put those in the Q&A. So if you have a question you'd like an answer to, feel free. We have a group of financial aid professionals who are working in the background to answer any questions you have as we go. Uh, and they will be happy to help in any way that you need help. The chat is open if you want to say hello, or we may pass messages to you in the chat if there's a link or something that we need to share with you. So with that in mind, let's get started. And let's say a word about really what we're doing today. So we're going to start by talking about why FAFSA, or the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, why completion matters, we're going to tell you a little bit about the FAFSA fiasco of 2024 that we've all lived through or are living through. If you haven't seen it, I'll help you understand why students may be um, reluctant or remiss in completing their FAFSA for this year. We're going to talk about how it isn't and why it isn't too late to help and really help understand how you can be part of the solution in helping our students get to higher education this year coming up in just a few short months. So first, why does the FAFSA matter? Well, the important thing to understand is that seniors in high school who complete a FAFSA are 84% more likely to immediately enroll in college than those who don't. So that's really important. Um, again, you know, we want to encourage students to complete their FAFSA once they have their FAFSA complete and find out about their financing options. They're so much more likely to attend college and we need your help in making sure that students get access to the FAFSA. The last year we have complete records for, it's a couple of years old now, is the 21-22 year. And I pulled this out because I wanted to show you that nearly $177 billion, B with a, a billion with a B, was given out in undergraduate financial aid in 21-22. And I know that there's a public note that most of that money is loans. I know that uh, sort of the, the, the common press would tell you that there's lots of loans, and if you want to apply for financial aid, all you're going to get is loans. And I, I'm here to say that is not true. In fact, if you look at the, at the pie chart with me, the single largest source of financial aid is actually institutional grant. 30% of the money that's awarded every year to undergraduates is awarded from institutions in the form of a reduction of tuition or fees or uh, support to housing or other expenses provided by the institution in itself. In fact, if you add up all the grant sources, if you take federal grants at 13%, uh, VA benefits at 4%, uh, 
uh, state grants at 7%, institutional grants at 30, private grants at 6. That's, if I could do my math quickly, that's about, if I get that, if I did that right, that's about 60% of the funding available is in the form of grant assistance. Um, someone can check my math and keep me honest if I'm wrong. So, uh, so you know, what's great about that is, again, there's a significant amount of money that's available in form of grant. There are other types of programs as well, and the FAFSA gets you access to all of those. So normally, in a normal annual cycle, October 1st, our application would open, uh, and a student would start their application cycle on October 1st. That is a normal year, October 1st of a student's senior year of high school. And some students will complete only a FAFSA. Others might complete a FAFSA or other applications that a school might require, like the CSS profile or some other application as well. And typically, the financial aid offer is prepared and sent usually with the admissions offers. That's usually how the cycle works in most years. This year was not like most years. This year, there was a complete rewrite of the federal financial aid system. And that was because of two laws that were passed the FAFSA Simplification Act of 2020, and the Future Act of 2019. They required a complete rewrite of the FAFSA, a complete rewrite of the computer systems running the FAFSA, and everything had to be reprogrammed. And originally, this was targeted, actually, for last year, the 23-24 academic year. But Congress agreed, the Department of Education asked for a one-year extension, and this year, the 24-25 year, and when I refer to academic years, I mean the year the student is attending college. So this coming year, the 24-25 academic year is the first year of the new FAFSA. And needless to say, the uh, outcome or the, the rollout of the FAFSA has been less than perfect. So if you've paid attention to the news, you've probably seen lots of news about this. But just to highlight a couple of things that went wrong, Remember, I said most years the launch begins on October 1st. This year, it wasn't October 1st. It wasn't November 1st. It wasn't December 1st. The FAFSA only went live on December 30th and only for a half an hour. Uh, and uh, it was live for an hour on December 31st. And it sort of rolled up gradually in January. So it definitely was delayed. Secondly, typically in a year, once you file a FAFSA, information is immediately shared with your college and university. This year, no data was shared with schools until the middle of March. So students completed their FAFSAs, but the federal government sat on that information. They didn't have the systems in place to give us that information. So we didn't get the information until mid-March. When we got it, the information they sent was riddled with errors. So there were errors with the IRS data. The whole point of this was to simplify the application. You'll see this a little later. Um, so that IRS data would automatically be transferred over. Parents wouldn't have to fill it in themselves. But there were errors in that transfer. There were errors in some behind the scene setup and formula as well. And there were really badly written questions. I'll show you some of those and we'll, how, to, how to prevent. And we fixed some of them. The department has, Department of Education has. But I'll highlight those for you tonight. And there was a problem for what we call mixed status families, families where a student is a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen, but their parents are not, and the application was not really helpful for them. Also, corrections typically are turned on, so a student might make a mistake, they might want to add another college. Those corrections weren't available until the middle of April. Again, typically corrections are available as soon as the FAFSA goes live in October. So student corrections would typically be available immediately. They weren't open until mid-April. And we are still waiting for school corrections. Actually, there's been an update since the slide. We're now expecting school corrections not to be available until mid-August. So you know, a real delay in the process and students have been frustrated. And what we've seen is the impact of this. And I, again, I'm telling you this because I want to explain, A, what caused the delay and why we're doing this special project this year and encourage your help because our students need your help. So what you'll see over here on the left side of the slide is an orange and blue line. The orange line is last year's senior class. The blue line is this year's senior class. And you can see these data. They come from the National uh, uh, EDCAN, National College Attainment Network. And you can see that the orange class started obviously October 1, much earlier. And actually you can see the dates going through. 
And this year, we weren't really even tracking until much later. But you can see that over time, in fact, this year's class is way behind. Only 43.3% of seniors have completed a FAFSA compared to 51.2% uh, in, 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 in the year before. And that's a 13% reduction. We're gaining ground. Uh, we've started at almost a 40% reduction, but we're still not there. And we need your help. And in fact, this is a particular problem for those of you based in Florida. This is a particular problem in Florida. Florida is out of 52 states, and I find it interesting that there are 52 states. The extra two are Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. But out of the 52 states and territories, uh, Florida is 49th in terms of the rate of high school seniors completing a FAFSA to date. And we need help to really move that up. And in fact, we are 46th when you look at the loss from last year to this year. So we need your help to make a difference and to make a change. And if you're from another state, you can find your information on the NCAN page as well. So what do we do about it? With all of this news, what should we do and what can you do? Well, first of all, it's not too late to apply for fall financial aid. Many families assume that it's too late at this point. It is not. In fact, uh, students can still apply for fall admission even at community colleges. If they've students have delayed uh, an application for admission or they've given up on the financial aid process in total, it is not too late to get their application done now. And we really want to encourage students to do that application and turn it in. It also isn't too late to apply for spring admission. Lots of schools have spring admissions programs. So even if a student is given up on fall, they have other plans, they can get their FAFSA done now for the spring semester. And even if a student's already enrolled, it, but they decided, I'm just not gonna bother with financial aid this year, they can still apply <laughs> for this year's financial aid cycle. It is not too late. And I apologize for my coughing. I have a little bit of an infection. Um, so it's good that we're doing this virtually, not in person. So uh, just bear with me if you hear me cough every so often, I'll try to control it. Okay, so how can you help? Well, this is what we're doing tonight. Uh, you are training to become a FAFSA advisor. If for every 10 FAFSA applications you secure from students who could attend college in the fall, you will receive a $500 stipend for each group of 10 students. And tonight, after the FAFSA portion of the presentation, I'll explain how do you submit your documentation and how do we get the, that stipend back to you. Um, so again, we're really hoping that you will help us identify students and reach out to students. Could be a current student in college, could be a potential student in college, could be an undergraduate, a graduate, doesn't really matter, right? Again, the idea here is we're hoping to encourage students to apply for the fall, completing the FAFSA. That is the goal. In addition, we are doing FAFSA family events. And if you go to FAFSA, oh, sorry, familyfafsa.com, you'll see some information about the FAFSA family events we're hosting. And those start this Wednesday. And we'll be again covering how to complete the FAFSA in these events. So if you know families who want some information or help, please encourage them to consider that. Here are the ways to reach out. This is my after tonight. If you have questions, and I'll give this to you again before the evening is done, this is how to email me. I'm at dbarkowitz at gmail.com. Or you can reach out to the project at fafsaguidance at gmail.com. Or you can visit fafsaadvising.com, which takes you to the Broward Bridge for Life site that is listed here. Okay, so what I want to do is I actually want to take us to the FAFSA itself and talk through the application process for the FAFSA. Now, I want to warn you, this presentation, as you can probably see on the screen, has 312 slides. I have some good news. We are not going to do all 312 slides. We would be here all evening, and we don't have any plans to do that. What we are going to do is step through one way to apply, which is with a dependent student and a parent, and I'll walk you through that. But if you have independent students or other situations, you might want to step through. And again, a lot of this information is literally screen after screen of the process. Most families will not need 312 steps. They just won't. Um, but it's very complete what we're going to share tonight, just because we want to make sure that you see what the requirements are and you see the information. Again, this copy, this 
PowerPoint is available at fafsaadvising.com. You can download it. You can take a look at it yourself from there. So let's let's jump in. So first of all, um, what I want to show you again is these are screenshots uh, that are sample screenshots. So you can see what the form looks like. And a couple of things that are really important as we begin. First of all, everyone who logs in is going to need an FSA ID. That FSA ID is a combination of a username and a password that's required to access the form. Um, and if a user doesn't have a social number, they can create an FSA ID and access the FAFSA form as well. That FSA ID needs to be created at least three days before you attempt to do the FAFSA. Why is that? Well, when you create an FSA ID, the government's going to validate that you are who you say you are. They're going to ask for your date of birth. They're going to ask for your social security number. And they're going to run that information against their databases to make sure that you're a valid person with a valid name and a valid social number and a valid date of birth. Once they do that, they validate you. You can then link up with the IRS and have your information automatically transferred over. But you want to give it that two to three days of time before you take the next, next step and complete the FAFSA form after you create your FSA ID. If you don't, you run the risk that there will be no link to the IRS. And again, remember, the whole purpose here is to link to the IRS and make this process easier for you. The form this year, if you've ever done a FAFSA before, the form this year is a little different. It is a roles-based form. What does that mean? What that means is when you log in, you will say, I'm a student or I'm a parent, and you will have specific questions simply focused on you. If you remember before, if you've never done one before, it was one form that everyone logged in together. But this year it is roles-based. So a student has their section of the application that only they can see. And if they're a dependent student, their parent has the section of the application that only they can see. And once information's entered, anyone can submit the form itself. The other piece that's important to know is a new concept or a new term called contributor. And I just want to define what contributor means. So most times when you think of contributors, that's someone who gives something like money, right? In this case, we're not talking about a financial contributor. What we're talking about is an information contributor. So when the Department of Education says contributor on the FAFSA, what they mean is someone who's going to provide information. That could be or will be the student. That could be a student's spouse if a student is married. Or if not, that could be a parent and a parent's spouse. And each one of those people could be a contributor. And we'll talk about who's required as we go through this. Contributors are required to provide the, the information needed, also to sign their section and to give consent. And again, we'll talk about consent and what that means as we go along tonight. Um, so the, the, the rest of this you can take a look at if you'd like to. What's important is that dependent students have to invite their parents and independent students have to invite their spouse if they have one. And you can correct and update your information as you go forward. Okay, let's go ahead then. And let's do an example of a dependent student who invites their parent to complete the form. And this is what most of your students will see when they go through this process. So to begin with, they're going to access this information by going to studentaid.gov. It is studentaid.gov. That is where the FAFSA form exists. Once they are there, they'll see FAFSA form in the upper corner of the website. They'll pull that down, and that will take them to the landing page. A couple of notes about this landing page. You'll see 2425 FAFSA form, start new form, or access existing form. Now, at this point, it's probably very late in the cycle, but if a student were applying for summer, they would complete a 2324 FAFSA form. And in fact, if a student is doing summer financial aid for many institutions in the state of Florida, this might differ school by school, but most of the state of Florida would have required a 2324 form, which you could see is still available on this main page. After July 1, there is no more access to last year's form, the 23-24 form. So if a student is looking to get financial aid for summer, and summer is a, um, a trailer, meaning it's the end of the last academic year, they need to get that FAFSA form done before July 1st. But otherwise, most of your students are going to log in using the Start New Form section on the top of the page. 
Once they do that, they're then asked to log in using their FSA ID. And again, remember that FSA ID is a combination of a username and a password. If they don't have one, they can click create an account. And that is how to create that FSA ID. Remember though, they're gonna wanna wait three days, up to three days to have their FSA ID confirmed before they go on. So that is where they can do the creation if they haven't done that to this point. Once they log in, they select their role. Remember I defined that your role as being either the student or the parent. In this case, it is a student. So the student is gonna select the student role and click continue. When a student starts the form for the first time, there are a couple of landing pages that just give you some basic information about the form itself. And there are a couple of videos that will be played. The first one walks you through what is the FAFSA form? The second page goes through who is a contributor. And again, how I've defined this before, but it goes through and explains it, tells them what documents they might need to complete the form. The third page talks about what to expect, how long will the application take? And while it says one hour, <coughs> I will say to you that that is not most students or parents experience. Most students and parents can complete the application in a much shorter period of time. I would say one hour is maximum. Um, when I did my FAFSA, mine took about 15 minutes. So just FYI. And the last video just talks about what happens after the form is submitted. How the school gets the information and what is next in the process. And then once you go through those four video pages, the next is to start your FAFSA form. So the first page is going to confirm the information the student has provided previously, their date of birth, their social security number, their email address, et cetera. If uh, there's any information that's wrong, they can access their student account settings and change that. But here's our student, Raya Tran, and she's going to confirm the information she's provided. So here's the first tricky question. Um, not really that tricky, but I guess for some people it is tricky. And that is date of uh, legal residence. So again, first question is uh, where the student resides. And again, for a Florida resident, that would be Florida and the date of their legal residency. So many students get confused. They don't know what to put here. If they were born in a state, it's their date of birth. If not, it's the day they moved. And in Florida, as an example, in Florida, we have a requirement that you have been in the state as a legal resident for one year prior to your attending college if you'd like to qualify for state financial aid in the state of Florida. Different states have different rules. Um, if you're unclear, you may want to talk to the state scholarship uh, authority in your school or in your state. But generally, again, for most students, that's going to be their date of birth. I will say for all these questions, there's a student version. And when we get to the parents section, you'll see very much it's the same kinds of questions asked again. So um, I'll highlight this now, but also say for parents, it's generally when the earlier of the two move to the state uh, if they didn't move jointly together. So just as an FYI. <clears throat> the next step is to provide consent. So let's talk about consent. Information from the IRS is going to be automatically transferred over from the IRS website or database to the FAFSA. So parents no longer have to enter their tax information. But to do that, the parent and student have to provide consent. Even if they have no tax record, parent or student has to provide consent to check to make sure they have no tax record. That consent is a necessary and required component of the financial aid application. If someone on the application is not willing to provide consent, then there will be no financial aid. So it's really important that parents and students be prepared to provide consent. Now you may get objections from a parent who says, well, I don't wanna give my tax information or I'm not willing to pay for the student's college. What I'd remind you is that consent to share information is not an agreement to pay for college. All it is is an agreement to provide information to determine if a student is eligible for financial aid. Whether or not the parent pays is a whole different question. So parents can provide consent without obligating themselves in any way or any shape to provide any financial support. It's really just to see if the student is eligible for financial aid. Sometimes I'll have a parent say to me, I really, I don't want to apply because I can't afford it. And my response is, well, that's the whole point of the FAFSA is to document that you can't afford it. That's why we encourage you 
to do the FAFSA. So once they can click through, there's all this documentation. You'll see approve is the blue button, and that moves you on to the next page. By the way, if you click decline, there'll be a pop-up that warns you about the ramifications of that. And a student who does, in fact, decline will be told, or a parent, that because of that, they will not be eligible for financial aid. Um, so they have to, you know, the, the application has really no purpose at that point. Okay. Again, I apologize. I have a cold and it is um, it is one of the things I'm dealing with. So let's jump into dependent personal circumstances. So this is the first section where we go through the personal situation of the student. And you'll see that the application signposts for the student where they are in the process. So every time we start a new section, it will tell the student that. And you can see at the top, there are five student sections, and it tells you where we are in the process. So the very first question is, what is the student's marital status? And to be clear, by the way, this question is asked of every student. We don't know yet if this is a dependent or an independent student. So if a student is a 59-year-old married parent going back to school, they'll be asked this question. If it's a 17-year-old going to school, they'll be asked this question. If it's a doctoral student, they'll be asked. Everyone's asked this question. So the very first question here is, what is the student's marital status? Now, in this case, we're seeing that Raya is indicating she is single, never married. And again, it says student. So we're going to answer about the student's marital status. The second question asks about the year in school. When they begin, what year in school will they be? <clears throat> and just as a, a piece of information here, you'll see first year, second year, other undergraduate or graduate student. Students who've attended dual enrollment in high school are still a first year student if they're beginning their college experience post high school graduation for the first time. The other piece of important information is the bottom of the page. Uh, sometimes students get confused and think that when they get their high school diploma, that is their bachelor's degree. It is not. Uh, and you wanna make sure if you're a high school graduate, you don't inadvertently answer yes there because there are some programs that people who have a bachelor's degree already are not eligible for. And we wouldn't want a student to decline something they might be eligible for. So just a fair warning on that question. The next page asks about personal circumstances. And these circumstances would prompt a student to be independent. So if they answer any of these questions, the student is going to be independent. So let's look at them. The first is, is the student on active duty in US Armed Forces? Are they a veteran? Do they have children of their own that they support? Were they an orphan after the age of 13? Were they awarded the court after the age of 13? Were they in foster care after the age of 13? Are they a legally emancipated minor? Or are they in guardianship with someone other than their parent or step-parent? If any of those are true, that a student is automatically independent and no parental information would be required. Again, for most situations, you're going to see likely that that is none of the above, which is what Raya checked. But just as a point of information, these are here in case that you have a student who has special circumstances like that. The next question says, at any time after July of 23, was the student unaccompanied and either homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? So the key issue here again is whether or not someone is independent. If you have a homeless student or a student who's at risk of homelessness, then they are independent and do not need parental information. Again, this is a student by themselves who is homeless, not a homeless family, but specifically a student who is unaccompanied and homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. Might be couch surfing, for example. <clears throat> if that is yes, and you click next, there will be then some information about how do you document that information. But in Raya's case, the answer is no. Uh, if you're working with a student whose answer is yes, there'll be another screen that pops up that asks do you, if it's, a, if it's um, provided by a shelter or what information can you provide to confirm that the student is in fact homeless. Once you move through that, there may be circumstances where a student is unable to secure parental information, right? That might be because there's abuse or neglect, or it might be because the student has lost contact with parents. And so this screen allows a student to say there are special circumstances. 
and I do not have contact with my parents? If the answer is yes, then the student must provide documentation of that to the college or university, but it will skip the parental information. Uh, in most cases, again, you'll probably have a no, but it is giving the student an opportunity to disclose if there is something that would put the student at risk so that they can disclose that if that is appropriate. And the last question on dependency status before we move to demographics is after all of that, if the student's parents refuse to provide information, so the student's not married, they're still, um, they're not an orphan, they're not a ward of the court, they're not homeless, they're not in an abusive or neglectful situation, but their parent refuses to provide information, then the student can answer yes here, but they will only receive a direct unsubsidized loan. That's a loan, very small amount the student has to pay all the interest for. In most cases, you're not going to want that. This is one of the questions that a lot of students have gotten tripped up on. Um, it used to say apply for direct unsub, and students would say, say yes, I'm going to apply and click yes. Again, the yes here indicates you can't get information from your parents. Really, ideally, in most situations, the answer to this question should be no. And then parent information will be required. So again, this is one that does cause some students some confusion. Okay. We're now going to move to information about your parents. So again, we have a dependent student, uh, Ryan, Raya Tran, and we're going to find out information about Raya's parents. So there are three questions that are going to be answer, uh, asked here. Um, and we're only going to see one because in this case, Raya has married parents. But I'm going to give you the other two just so that you have information about what you might see. So the first question asks, are the parents married to each other? In Raya's case, she answered yes. Her uh, birth or biological or adoptive parents is who we're talking about here. And those parents are married to each other. So for the purposes of the FAFSA form, both Raya's parents are going to provide information. But let's take a slightly different case. Let's say the answer to that question was no. The next question that would be asked is, are your parents unmarried and living together? So let's say Raya's parents never got married, but they live in the home together with Raya. In that situation, we would still want information from both parents. If the answer to that question is no, so no, they're not married to each other, and no, they're not unmarried and living together. The third question will say, um, uh, pick the parent who provides uh, more financial support over the last 12 months. So basically, it's not who the student lives with. It's not who claims the student on the tax return. It's who gives the student more financial support, who pays the bills. If the answer is exactly even, <laughs> then the student's told to pick the parent who has more income and assets. But again, basically the idea here is to choose the parent, and there's no documentation. No one from the aid office is going to collect information to prove this. This is really up to the student to disclose which parent provides more financial support to them. Once that parent is selected, if that parent is remarried, then it would be that parent and their remarried spouse. So usually I like to give an example here to make this easier. So let's say um, I am I am uh, divorced. Um, my wife and I, Colleen and I, divorced many years ago. Um, I provide more financial support. So the student's going to choose me as the parent and I am remarried and my new spouse name is Rebecca. So Rebecca and I are going to be parents for the purpose of this form, even though Rebecca is the student's step parent, um, that information is still required from her because she's part of the family. So if you do have questions about that, feel free to ask them in the Q&A and our folks can answer those for you. But generally that is the way this works for families who, um, who are in that situation. To answer the question, Barbara, that you asked, what happens if the parents are divorced both give 50-50 support, and one parent is remarried, the student would be asked in that situation, who has the greater income, mom or dad? And she would have to choose that parent. And then if that parent's remarried, uh, she'd have to provide the remarried spouse information as well. Okay, moving on. Once that information is provided, 
Then the student is asked to provide information on the two parents. So you'll see point A, parent who will fill out this form, and point B, parent, spouse, or partner. Now, a couple of pieces that are really important here. First of all, just because both parents are required or were required to provide information about both parents, that doesn't mean both parents are going to complete the form. The form is completed, and we'll talk about this, by at least one parent in a case of married filing jointly tax information. But it's possible that we might need information from both parents. You'll see on here that the student is asked to disclose the name, which should be fairly easy, the date of birth, which might be a little harder, and the social security number, which is going to be really hard. So a bunch of students or most students don't know their parents' social security number, but you have to have that information to disclose here. What we've noticed is a lot of students, when they get to this question, realize they don't have their parents' social security number. So they click the box that says, my parent doesn't have an SSN. Well, that's not true. Their parent has one. They just don't have it with them. And unfortunately, that's not the right answer. You have to have the parent's social security number to be able to complete this section of the form. So as you're working with students, please make sure that they have their parent's information. If their parent legitimately doesn't have an SSN, they can click that box and they'll be asked to provide their ITIN number, their individual taxpayer identification number. If they don't have one of those, that's fine. It will then go through a process to confirm identity. And this is where mixed status families, they've fixed this now, so mixed status families can complete the application. It's also really important they type the correct email address in because an email will be sent as soon as the student clicks send invite, which will invite the parent to begin their section of the form. So these three questions, date of birth, social security number, and email address, really very important. And what we often find, or when there are problems, we do find that students have mistyped one of these pieces of information. If that is true, they can always log back in and correct it, or the parent can log in to their student aid uh, uh, .gov account and find an invitation or search for the student by social number. But again, really important that you try to get that information correctly. So now we move to the student demographics section. And again, this is really basic information about parents and other information. First of all, these next questions are optional. The first one asks about gender, and the student is not required to answer. This will have no bearing on their financial aid. This is just for informational purposes. Then there are questions about ethnicity and race, which again, also are optional. <coughs> no harm for students not to answer these questions either. The next question asks about student citizenship status. This is very important. Students have to be either US citizens or eligible non-citizens to qualify for federal financial aid. Well, there are lots of eligible non-citizen types. In most cases, that would be people who have a green card or a permanent residence, but it's possible that a student might be here as a asylee or a refugee or um, a Violence Against Women Act uh, enrollee. Um, there are lots of reasons why a student might qualify as an eligible non-citizen. If you're interested and the student's not clear, if you do a search for eligible non-citizen and FAFSA on Google, you will find information about what makes a student an eligible non-citizen. Also important to understand that it's just the student citizenship status that matters. So a student could be a U.S. citizen and their parents are not, and they still will qualify, will qualify for financial aid. So let's say, for example, um, the student's parents were medical doctors who were here for a year of residency, but actually have their citizenship overseas, and the student was born in this country. So because of that, the student is a U.S. citizen. Because of that, the student could actually qualify for federal financial aid, even though their parents might not be a U.S. citizen. So that is allowable. The next question asks about parents' education status. Did either of your parents attend college or complete college? This is important for some state scholarship programs and other school college programs, but it's basically just identifying if the student is a first-generation student or not. <clears throat> the next question asks if their parent or guardian was killed in the line of duty, either 
serving in active duty in the armed forces or uh, as a public service officer? If the answer is yes, then there'll be some special benefits that accrue to the student in terms of the Pell Grant. Uh, but again, in most cases, that will likely be a no answer. Next question asks about the student's high school completion status. Where are they in their high school degree program? And they will, in this case, select a high school diploma. But if they have a GED certificate or a homeschool, they can select that as well. If they select a high school, then there's a search process where they can look up the high school by choosing state and city and pull the particular high school. This is really just for tracking purposes. And so the high school knows if their students are completing the FAFSA or not. The information is not given to the high school by student, but the numbers are. So generally, how many students from Broward High School or uh, you know whatever the high school might be have completed the application? Once they confirm their high school, we then move to the financial section. So we're now moving into section three. And what's great about the financial section is it's actually really easy. Most of the information just gets transferred straight over from the IRS. So there's not a lot of information for the student to answer. It's pretty simple. The, uh, again, most of these are not going to apply to students that you're working with, but these questions will repeat for parents. So may, let's make sure that we mention them. Number one, if the student has had a pension that they've rolled over from one pension to another or from a pension into an IRA, then that information will show up as part of their income but they get to deduct it here. It's highly unlikely you're working with a student who has a pension, but parents might. So maybe a parent has taken their pension from one company to another, and this allows them to report that so that that's not counted as income. Second question. Occasionally, students get enough grant or scholarship assistance that they have to pay taxes on it. If that is the case, because you've gotten so much in grant or scholarship assistance, that you owe um, money to the IRS because it's considered income, then the amount of that grant or scholarship above the, what you know was non-taxable, so the taxable portion, would be listed here. Again, highly unlikely for new students, highly unlikely for parents, but possible in some situations that some amount of scholarship information was included as income. If that's the case, it would be listed here. And the third type, again, mostly unlikely, is going to be for families who live abroad or work abroad and earn foreign income um, as earned income abroad. In that situation, what happens is you're not taxed on that uh, foreign income in the U.S. You get to subtract it, but it is income. So the report here is how much of that income was reported or subtracted from your adjusted gross income on the IRS form. Again, most students are not going to have these three types, but it's important to understand what those questions are for. <coughs> the next session asks about assets. So how much does the student have in cash and savings? How much if they own a business or a farm? Again, probably unlikely a student owns a farm, but they might have a small business. What assets are in that business or farm? And third, what kind of investments like stocks or bonds, um, including real estate, would the student own in the net worth? Again, these questions are going to be asked both of students and parents. A couple things about assets I want to highlight for you. Number one, when it asks about assets on the FAFSA, we never include the permanent residence or the student's home. So when we get to the parent section and it asks about real estate, what we do not mean is the home that the student lives in. So we're talking about other real estate. Um, that might be a rental property. That might be half of a two-family home that the family lives in. That would be other investments or other real estate. When it comes to uh, investments like stocks or bonds, what we're not talking about here is retirement. It never asks you to disclose how much the student or parent has in retirement accounts. If it's a specially designated retirement account, like a 401k or a 403b, it is not disclosed. What we're talking about here are things like money market accounts or stock portfolios. Again, generally unlikely a student has them, but maybe a parent has them and they would have to be disclosed in this section when we get to the parent section. So just an information about that. 
Okay. Next is where the student selects the colleges they're applying to. So much like the high school section, this is where they would log in, click continue, and now they're going to do their last section before the student is done with their part. And once again, you can search by state and name, or if the school has a school code that they've provided to the student, usually a six-digit code, the student can look by school code as well. Now, the student can list up to 20 high schools, sorry, 20 colleges on the application form. And really important, they don't have to be admitted. They don't even have to have applied for admission to list the, high, the, the college on the FAFSA application. It's just important they get that FAFSA application in, even if they haven't yet applied to be admitted, they can list up to 20 schools uh, at no cost to them. Very easy just to list them. So they search, they click, they add it. And last, finally, they're asked to review the information they provided and confirm the information is correct, continue, and sign and complete. This is also very important. The last step is the student must sign and complete the application. If a student abandons the application here, they actually have not completed it. They have to sign it digitally. And the digital signature is just simply clicking on the box and saying sign because they've signed in using their, uh, their FSA ID and password. They can click on that and they're fine and can move forward. Now, remember, we still have to do parental information. And you're gonna see the parent information is very much like the student section. So it should move fairly quickly through. They've signed their section. The invitation's gone off to their parents. And now it's time to move on to the parent side. Now, this is what the parent will get as an email. So this is an example of an email that the parent might get. In this case, it's Alcina. Alcina is, is emailed this email that says, hey, help complete Raya's form. And this would come from federal student aid. And it would have a link, get started, to get started and to be taken to studentaid.gov, which is where Alcina will complete her section. So we're going to go fairly quickly through this because much of this is going to be very similar to what you've just seen. So again, they're going to log in. If they haven't created an account, they can create an account right here. And let's talk about which parent or parent needs to complete this section. So keep in mind, if the student is filing with two parents and those parents file their tax return together, married filing jointly, then only one parent would need to log in and complete the FAFSA. The only difference in that is if either the parents file separately from each other as married filing separately, or they both don't file the tax return, or one files a tax return and the other doesn't. In those situations, then both parents would have to log in. Think about it this way. What's happening here is they're trying to match the parent information with the tax information. And as long as the tax information contains both adults, both parents, only one person needs to log in to match it. It's when there are potentially different records that you have to have both parents create a record. In Raya's case, it's fairly simple because her parents file together, file jointly. So only one parent has to complete the information. Once they log in, they will get a note that says, hey, Raya wants your help. Uh, are you accepting the invitation? Yes. Do you agree to share your information? Yes. And it defines what does it mean to share your information? Why are you being asked? What kind of information will you be asked? And allows the parent to click continue. Now, again, much like the student side, the next four screens are going to be the same short videos to provide information about what is the FAFSA form, what's a contributor, what to expect, and what happens after you submit the form. And then, much like before, the parent gets to confirm, yes, this is really me. Like before, we have consent information, and the parent is asked to provide consent. Again, if they choose not to, they're told Raya will not get any financial aid. So it's really important that the student, or the parent, rather, in this case, provides consent. And there's a question here, if I'm not married and didn't file a joint return, does my spouse have to provide consent? And the answer would be yes. So now we turn to parent demographics. So this is going to be a little different than the student side, but not all that much different. The first question is, what is your parents' current marital status? In this case, they are married, not separated. 
The parents asked about their state of legal residence. As I told you before, this would be the earlier of the two dates that the parent moved to the state. It doesn't really matter as long as it's more than a year ago. In Florida, it all is the same. And that's it. We now move to parent financials. And once again, much of the information is going to be automatically transferred. The first page asks about particular federal benefits that the parent may receive. That could include SNAP, or it could include earned income tax credit, or SSI, or TANF, or WIC, or free or reduced lunch. If any of those are true, then it's conceivable that assets might be skipped, and the parent does not have to provide asset information based on their income level. Um, but otherwise, in this case, Raya's parents are asking or answering none of these apply. Couple of questions. Number one, did you file a 2022 IRS form 1040 or 1040 NR? Yes or no? In this case, they answered yes. And did you file a 22 joint tax return with your current spouse? The answer is yes. That's important because if you're filing differently now, so let's give an example. Let's say uh, the parent was married in 22, but has divorced and is now refiling married this year, this FAFSA, with a different spouse, that would be really important to know because they don't want the information to transfer over directly for a spouse that's no longer in the picture. If that's the case and they answered no, then in that situation and in that situation only, the parent would be asked to provide information by hand about their income. In most situations, income information is just going to be transferred over automatically. <clears throat> But it may be the case, excuse me, that if the parents are divorced or there's a difference between what the um, filing status was in 22 and now, that the family may need to provide information by hand. The next question asks to confirm the family size. So let's say, and again, they're going to use the number of dependents and exemptions from the tax form. But let's say that Raya and her family, for example, uh, take care of their grandparents and provide more than half of their support, but didn't claim them on the tax return. Or let's say Raya's mother had a surprise baby and now there's a new baby in the house that wasn't there in 2022. In that situation, right, the student can say no, um, the family size is different than what was on the tax form and the student can update this information. In most case, or parent rather, in most cases, it's going to be uh, not updated or not needed to be updated. But if there's been a difference or additional people, this is how you do it is with this first question. The bottom question says, uh, how many dependents live with the family um, and will receive more than half of their support? And again, this is just to confirm the number of, in the family is correct. The next question says, out of the people in the family, how many will be in college in this coming year? This is really just for information purposes. So the college understands where else students or how many other students might be attending. It doesn't have any impact on the financial aid, but it is a question that is asked. And here are the three questions that parents have to answer or four about their tax information. These will look very familiar. We talked about rollover into an IRA before. We talked about college grants and scholarships before. We talked about foreign earned income exclusion before. The new question here is, did the parent receive the earned income tax credit? This is a tax benefit that accrues to the lowest income families. It serves as a refund back against your tax liability. So if the parent had it, they could say yes. Uh, in this case, Rye's parent is saying no. <clears throat> we now turn to the parent asset section. The one difference here is this first question. And by the way, just a signpost for you, we are very close to done with the parent section. So thank you for staying on board. Um, and we're gonna take some time to answer questions soon. I just wanna show you a couple of the things before we finish up, but we're very close to the end of this application. But new here in this section is annual child support received. So if a parent receives child support, from another parent, and that's the parent who's filling out the FAFSA, the one who receives the support, they're asked here to report how much support did they get, child support, in the last complete calendar year. 
Well, that's interesting, right? Right now we're in 2024. So the last complete calendar year is 2023. But I said all the tax information was coming from 2022. That is correct. That's a disconnect. So in this case, the child support would be how much child support did this family receive in 23, even though the tax information is from 22. So just an FYI in case that comes up. Parents asked to provide information about the other parent just in case there's other information needed. They're asked to review their section to sign it. And they're done. So once they are done, an email is sent to confirm that that information has been received. That email is very important because that's the email you're going to need to submit to show proof that you've assisted a family in completing their FAFSA. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. But that's really important uh, as part of your process. So I want to just share a couple of other things with you um, just to show you what comes back on the other side. Again, keep in mind you have a lot of information in this presentation if you want to go back and look at it later. But let's talk a little bit about the FAFSA submission summary. So once the FAFSA is completed, both parent and student section, the student will be able to log in. They'll get an email confirming that it's been completed. And they can log in and look at their FAFSA submission summary. And it will tell them their information. It will give them their student aid index, which is an important index to know how much financial aid they qualify for. And it will also give them all the answers to the information they provided and talks about next steps. So again, that information is what you will need. It actually will come in an email uh, that the student receives. And that information is what you need then to submit to receive the funding, the $500 that we're offering for every 10 FAFSAs you complete. What I'm going to do now is show you the uh, form that we're looking for you to complete. So once you've collected 10 completions, this is our form, and we will send you this link in an email after tonight. This is the form we will ask you to log in and complete. And with that information, you will be able to confirm your first name, last name, email address, and mailing address, so we know where to send the check to you, your phone number, what organization or school you might represent, and here's where you add a file with confirmations of those 10 screenshots from students who are applying for 24, 25 on their FAFSA. Again, does not have to be first time in college, could be people who are continuing, could be graduate students, could be undergraduate students. We're looking for your help maximally to encourage as many people as possible to complete the FAFSA and to get the FAFSA completed. So with that, what I'm going to do is stop the share and see if there are questions or any information that we can answer for you. Um, good question. <clears throat> Marlene asks, how long does it take to process an application? The answer to that is it would take up to three to five days, but it could be faster. Once you submit the application, there's some work that happens on the back end. <clears throat> it has to match against information provided by the Department of Education and other um, and other matching agencies. So it takes a little bit of time on the back end, but within three days, generally, it's sent to the colleges and universities. Corrine asks, why would it be 10 screenshots? The answer to that question is because, again, we're asking for 10 different students. So as long as you complete this for 10 different students, um, if you want to update all of it in one document, that is fine. Just put it all together in one document and submit that. And from that, you will receive the $500. Um, question for you, Colleen, if you're monitoring. I don't know that I have the answer to this one. Um, which is, uh, sorry, uh, would I count toward the 10? So I'm assuming this is from a student who's looking, um, and is she, if she is going to school herself, would she be one of the 10 people? Um, if she is in college, yes. Uh, but okay. Tamika asked another good question earlier, and I think it's worth clarifying this question. What is the deadline? So since we're hosting FAFSA sessions into August, um, can you explain how a 24-25 enrollee can still be filling out the application after the federal deadline? Yes. 
Yeah. So just to be clear, so um, there are two answers to that question. There's the answer of when's the FAFSA deadline, and there's the answer of when is our project deadline. So I want to be clear about the difference between those two. So for federal financial aid, the deadline is next June, right? So a student for this year can apply for financial aid at any point this year up through next June 30th. There is no rush. There is plenty of time. That said, obviously, we want to get students to apply as soon as possible to get the ball rolling for them. And our project is only funded into August. So we want to make sure that the ones you're working with, you get them and submit them no later than, what's the date we gave, Colleen? Is that August 15th? Yep, August 15th. So August 15th is the date by which we need to have your submissions turned in so we can make sure to get them processed and turned around by the end of August. So two answers. Deadline federally, you have all year, but deadline for our project of the $500 is August 15th. I hope that answers that question for you. Other other questions? And the $500 is for every 10 families that you support. So you could be making more than 500. Um, uh, yes. And we're gonna, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Process payment to you uh, by collecting your forms at the end of each month. Um, and you will be mailed a hard copy check. That's how the payment will be processed. And again, we're encouraging you to get as many students to complete the form as possible because we really want to make a difference. Um, so if you can do 10, that's great. If you can do 15, that's great. For every, I mean, 20 rather, if you can do 10 or 20 or 30, for every 10 students you help complete the form, there'll be a $500 check associated with that. Um, <laughs> there's a great question. I love this question. There are rumors that the 25-26 FAFSA might not be ready for October 1 this fall. What information have you heard? I've heard a lot of information. I just came back from our National Financial Aid Administrators Conference. What I would say in response to that is what I heard, which is the Department of Education is committed to getting the FAFSA form launched by October 1. Now, I'll say a couple of words and parse that for you. They're committed to getting it launched. That doesn't mean it will launch. That means they're going to make every effort to get it launched by October 1st. It also, by the way, doesn't mean that all the back-end stuff will be turned on. So remember how I said at the start, while the FAFSA went live <coughs> on December 30th, it took until the middle of March before we at the colleges got our information. So to be clear about that, right, what that means is I could imagine that it will go live October 1 for families to complete, but that doesn't mean that it would be live for us at the schools necessarily so quickly. It may take some time, but stay tuned. Um, we'll let, we, you know, there'll be lots of information about it as we go. There was also a question about, could we have a copy of the PowerPoint? Just to remind you, and let me show you this. I'll, I'll actually do a quick demo of this. So if you go to the website, so hold on, let me share. Hopefully, you are seeing my screen. Um, so here is the FAFSA advising webpage. If you look on the webpage, we are doing this uh, webinar several times. You can see at the bottom, here is the link to the actual PowerPoint. So if you click on that link, this will take you to a website from the Department of Education that has both the PowerPoint and the PDF version of the 312 slides. So you can feel free to download either of those and the way to get there is from the website fafsaadvising.com. So there is no PowerPoint script or talking points really for the presentations. That is up to you. Um, and again, you can, uh, you know, you can basic, oh, and, and you can si simply help families do this in a way that feels comfortable for you. You don't have to do a presentation like we did tonight with families. Um, and just, just FYI, I use the 300 page. I just went through the first section of the form, but you can also just be on the line with them uh, or sitting with them or on a Zoom call and helping them complete the form. 
Um, you can feel free to use the PowerPoint from the Department of Education and just shorten it out as you want, or you don't even have to use a PowerPoint. Again, it's really up to you as to how you decide to help families. That is your, your choice and your call. Uh, there are a couple of other questions. Let's see. So Tracy asks and Debbie's answering it, but yes, the federal deadline for the 24-25 FAFSA is June 30 of 25. That means students could get retroactive aid. They have to get their FAFSA in while they're enrolled. So you can't do it after like, you know, semester late, but yes, um, that is true. So you have a lot of time. Barbara asks, have you heard anything about colleges in Florida that have not given out financial aid packages yet if graduating students filed? I have. There are some colleges that are still struggling with getting their information systems up and running. So what I would suggest um, in that situation, if you have a student who's working with one of those colleges, is just to reach out to the financial aid office directly and ask for information and help from them. Uh, Tamika asks, can you share where and how most people are finding students? What I would say is most people are finding them through their networks, either through their social networks or through their um, their professional networks and reaching out to students who may have graduated from high school or people who are thinking about going back to school. Uh, really, we, we rely on you and we're hoping you'll find connections. Um, and I would suggest that you can share again that you have – uh, been trained on how to complete the FAFSA and you're here to help. Um, and, you know, your goal is to evangelize and help get students enrolled. Um, so I would use your, your networks to see who you can reach out to. Uh, Tracy asks, can graduate students get grants or any only unsubsidized loans? So Tracy, from the federal government, the only program that's available through the FAFSA for graduate students is loans. However, there are lots of individual grants or fellowships or stipends that might be available from the individual colleges, universities, and often they may ask for the FAFSA as part of that application. Okay, so here's what I'd like to do. I just want to say I appreciate the time. I appreciate all the information. Um, Tron, I'm going to suggest we go ahead and stop the recording. And I'm going to say thank you to all of you for being with us tonight. We hope this information was helpful. We look forward to being of assistance. If you have more questions, feel free again to reach out to me at dbarkowitz at gmail.com or to the FAFSA Advising Gmail page. Thank you so much.